and great. And then I'm going to let the moderators get it started. Good evening. Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone to the Neuroendocrine Tumor Awareness Month webinar hosted by the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons and in partnership with the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, or NANIT. I'm Dr. Jason Glenn. I'm an endocrine surgeon with Centricare Health in Central Minnesota, and I'm one of tonight's moderators. Hello, I'm Joy Shen. I'm also an endocrine surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, and I am the other moderator for tonight's webinar. We have assembled an expert panel to discuss and answer common questions about neuroendocrine tumors. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the AAES Facebook page and YouTube channel within the next week. We would like to thank Nanit for partnering with us. If time permits, we will also be taking live questions from the audience this evening. You can enter your questions in the comment section directly on the Facebook live stream. Please be aware that we will not be answering any personal medical questions or providing specific medical advice. For those types of questions or requests, please seek advice from your doctor or medical team. All right, we will start by introducing our panelists in alphabetical order. Dr. Ghassan El Haddad, section head for radionuclide therapy program at Moffitt Cancer Center. Dr. Jessica Maxwell, assistant professor in surgical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Rodney Palmier, Professor in Surgical Oncology at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Heloisa Doares, Associate Professor in Medical Oncology at University of Utah Huntsman Cancer Institute. And Dr. Rune Yu, Professor in Endocrinology at University of California, Los Angeles. Great, I would like to thank, um, thank you to all our panelists for joining us. So we're gonna get right to the questions. First, I'd like to start and ask a question to Dr. Maxwell. Let's start with the basics. Can you explain what a neuroendocrine tumor is? Where in the body can they be located? And what is the difference between a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor and a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumor? Yeah, I'll give this my best shot. So, you know, neuroendocrine tumors are sort of a unique type of cancer because they arise from specialized cells that can arise in multiple different locations throughout the body. The cells are specialized because they share traits um, of both hormone producing endocrine cells, but also nerve cells, which is how they get their name. Because they can arise almost anywhere, that means that these tumors can also arise in various spots throughout the body. But usually we see them in places like the lung, the pancreas, or in the GI tract, small bowel, colon, rectum. Um, the, had you already asked about the nets versus necks, or is that how we? Yeah, I wanted to know the difference between a well differentiated versus a poorly differentiated. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a really interesting thing that's kind of evolved over time and, um, has gotten all the more exciting in recent years. So the, the way that we refer to these tumors is really important. And the words that we use can tell people a lot about the biology of these tumors or how they're going to behave. So a neuroendocrine tumor is something that is diagnosed under a microscope. And it implies that the tumor is well differentiated. And what I mean by that is that although they are cancer cells, these cancer cells have shared traits or still look like regular cells in your body from the, the organ in which they arise. And why that's important is because the more normal they look, the more likely they are to behave in a predictable way. Um, so a neuroendocrine tumor, when you use that, a net, that's a well-differentiated tumor. A neuroendocrine carcinoma is something that is similar but different. And it's important that that carcinoma is used very specifically because this implies that the tumor is poorly differentiated. So these tumors have lost more of their normal cellular function. They look different 
under a microscope compared to a neuroendocrine tumor, and they tend to behave far more aggressively. And it's also really important to note that neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas are treated very differently, both from a medical oncology perspective and a surgical oncology perspective. Um, once we have divided these neuroendocrine neoplasms into either well diff or poorly diff, then we think about grading. And this is something that has evolved over the past few years. Um, you know, it, we used to think about grade three, which are the most aggressive types of neuroendocrine neoplasms as all being neuroendocrine carcinomas. So that if you looked at the tumor under the microscope and it was, and it had lost a lot of its normal, normal look to it, we would put it under carcinoma. We would look at how many cells were dividing. And then we would say, it's a carcinoma, it needs to be treated with chemotherapy, and we don't really consider it for surgery, particularly in the early stages. Now we know that actually neuroendocrine tumors come in grades one through three, and it's this grade three well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor that is the newest entity and is important to differentiate from grade three poorly differentiated carcinomas because they're going to be considered differently and tend to act more like a neuroendocrine tumor than they act like a neuroendocrine carcinoma. And so the way in which we think about them and treat them is sort of evolving, but that, that differentiation and being very precise with our language and making sure that you have pathologists that understand this unique entity and can really differentiate between a carcinoma and a well diff G3 is really important. Great. Okay. Um... I have a question for Dr. Yu. What type of neuroendocrine tumors can produce hormones and be functional? And what symptoms do they cause? And how do you make the diagnosis of a functional neuroendocrine tumor? So as uh, Dr. Uh, Maxwell uh, mentioned earlier, uh, neuroendocrine tumors tend to produce uh, hormones. Uh, that's where the, the, the term endocrine uh, part uh, uh, comes from. And uh, almost all neuroendocrine tumors can produce uh, uh, a certain uh, number of, uh, or certain uh, amount of hormones, um, but that they, uh, whether they produce a hormone is strong enough to cause a clinical uh, symptom um, uh, uh, where it's a lot. Um, so uh, technically all tumors, uh, neuroendocrine tumors could produce a hormone uh, we call them uh, functional in our jargon. But the most common hormone uh, tumor uh, hormone syndrome produced by neuroendocrine tumors usually uh, come from the uh, pancreas and uh, from the uh, of a small bowel uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumor called the carcinoid. Uh, the, probably the most common uh, endocrine tumor syndrome is uh, insuloma syndrome. Uh, so the insuloma is usually a benign tumor um, that uh, produces an uh, uh, excess amount of uh, uh, insulin. And uh, this insulin then will cause a low blood sugar. Uh, so people can pre uh, present with uh, uh, dizziness, uh, very uh, uh, hungry, uh, you know, sweating with a heart beating fast. And uh, uh, because this is a rare cause of low mm -hmm. blood sugar, uh, a di diagnosis is often missed. Uh, the second and most common uh, um, hormone syndrome is a gastrinoma syndrome. Uh, gastrinoma is a tumor uh, either from the uh, pancreas or the duodenum or from a, a surrounding uh, lymph node. Uh, it produces gastrin. Gastrin then stimulate uh, our stomach cells to produce uh, uh, actual stomach acid that starts causing a uh, duodenal ulcer or uh, a stomach ulcer. Uh, that people usually present with uh, 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 abdominal fullness uh, or a uh, uh, frank pain. Um, the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor can also produce a number of other uh, hormone syndromes, such as uh, glucagonoma, VIPoma, somatostatinoma, but those are very rare. And uh, if a particular patient has, an, uh, mm -hmm. has a particular question, we can talk about them more, but those are, are are usually not commonly seen uh, in our daily practice. Uh, they, they, there's a third, uh, I won't answer a third, but the other common uh, um, uh, tumor uh, 
syndrome is a carcinoid syndrome. So uh, carcinoid tumor uh, is uh, in today's uh, today's uh, terminology is called a, a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, uh, but the old name is called the carcinoid. So we kind of inherit that name. Uh, the carcinoid syndrome is a tumor syndrome possibly or likely caused by excess serotonin produced by the tumor. It can also be caused by uh, other uh, materials released uh, from the carcinoid tumor. Uh, the carcinoid syndrome can present uh, uh, with uh, flushing, uh, diarrhea, abdominal pain. The, uh, the often cited uh, uh, wheezing is actually very rarely seen uh, uh, in most people with uh, uh, carcinoid syndrome. Great, thank you. That was very informative. Um, we're going to move on. Dr. Soros, what are the risk factors for a neuroendocrine tumor to be more aggressive or spread? Can you also include some you know, patho pathologic features that are concerning? Yeah, sure. And thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here with you. So that's a very complicated question, or the answer can um, be a little bit different as neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine neoplasmas are all different. So I think one of the easy ways to say um, which of these um, neoplasmas are at high risk to um, spread is number one, the aggressive pathology. As uh, Dr. Maxwell mentioned, tumors that are poorly differentiated or have the name of um, carcinoma, um, they are, um, um, have a very, very high chance to metastasize. And often at the time of diagnosis, um, we already, if we do the imaging on the patients, they unfortunately already have disease that has spread. But that's why when Dr. Maxwell was mentioning, she uh, alluded that these this, um, cancers are treated very uh, differently from the neuroendocrine tumors. On the neuroendocrine tumor side, um, it depends which primary location the tumor um, is started. For example, um, a tumor that is in the pancreas and is less than one centimeter has a very low chance of spreading. And we typically will recommend that patients that are felt to have a well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with a, with a tumor that's less than one centimeter can be often uh, monitored without even having the need for the resection because the chances of spreading are very low. And about uh, when they're over two centimeters, then when we will recommend resection, and then when there's other characteristics that can suggest that the tumor has a high risk of um, spreading. When we look at the small bowel tumors, I, I tell my patients that sometimes little busters that are like five to six millimeters already are a very, um, have a very high chance of metastasizing. And unfortunately, many patients at the time of the diagnosis, they already will have uh, um, the tumor spread to lymph nodes around where the tumor starts in the small bowel or potentially um, to the liver. Um, another tumor that typically when the size is small has a very low chance of metastasizing is in the appendix. We know now that if we find out that someone has an appendiceal neuroendocrine tumor that is less than two centimeters, um, if they, that uh, tumor has been resected because the patient underwent an appendicectomy for whatever reason, sometimes we think the patients have appendicitis and when they have the OR, uh, they go to the OR and the pathology comes back and the then they, um, actually we see that they have a neuroendocrine tumor. If it's less than two centimeters, the chances of that spreading is very, very low, and typically we don't recommend that these patients need any long-term um, oncology follow-up. Rectal size is also um, something that if we resect the tumors, and the tumors are very small, and sometimes you can even do endoscopic resections, um, the chances of these tumors metastasizing is um, um, very small. So in general, I know that I, I talk a lot, but it's because every little site has a little bit of the nuances. But in general, if someone has a pathology with a neuroendocrine carcinoma, definitely is a very high chance of spreading. If someone has a well-differentiated grade three, uh, which shows that the tumor is um, a little bit more aggressive, they also have a chance of metastasizing. Um, if uh, for um, a given reason, a patient went to, res went to resection, and we find out that the patient actually has positive lymph nodes at the time of resection. That also puts 
the patients on a higher risk for in the future having the disease to come back um, in other um, organs. Um, I just should mention also that for the gastric um, neuroendocrine tumors, especially if they are what's called type 1, when we see a lot of them in the stomach, the chances of then um, spreading is very, very, very low. So it's, I, um, I, it's, a, it's a, um, a happy concert. I say happy concert because I'm giving relief to the patients when they come and see me. And I, I, I educate them. They are so worried about having cancer. I educate them that they can take a deep breath. And then that is not likely a tumor that will ever lead to them um, dying from because it's something very localized. And then we do some education about gastric type 1 uh, neuroendocrine tumors. That's it. Sorry, talk too much. Oh, no. Thank you, Dr. Suarez. Um, that was great. Uh, next question would be for Dr. Pamier. Can you tell us your strategy for how to localize or find a neuroendocrine tumor and what tests or imaging studies do you use? And what do you do when those imaging studies are negative? Certainly. So as Dr. Savara has mentioned, sometimes these tumors are very, very tiny. Neuroendocrine tumors don't follow the standard cancer paradigm where you have to get a very large primary tumor before it spreads to lymph nodes and then have a big primary tumor and many positive lymph nodes before you see metastases to the liver. So uh, in, in some tumor types, 60 to 80% of patients present with liver metastases and they can't find the primary. Uh, and that's because they're tiny. They aren't really all occult. They're just they're just difficult to find. So I always start with the cross-sectional imaging uh, because there may be clues there that have been missed even by uh, very good radiologists. Uh, for example, very often when I read, a, if I find a mesenteric mass in the small bowel mesentery, that's almost pathognomonic for a tiny small bowel uh, primary tumor being present. And it, it is not uncommon that radiologists miss it. When they are scanning the CAT scan of the abdomen and looking for lymphadenopathy, they're looking for a jelly bean to kidney sized in large lymph nodes. And these mesenteric masses can be very large and they mistake it for just another loop of bowel. So, um, you know, if I had a nickel for every time I was the first to spot the CT, uh, the mesenteric mass, I'd have $3 and 85 cents. Um, there are other nodal clues that you can see. If we see celiac nodes and splenic vessel nodes, that's a clue that we may have a tumor in the pancreas, a very large node in front of the uh, infrahepatic uh, intravena, uh, inferior vena cava is a strong sign that we have a duodenal primary. But if all those are negative, then we actually have very good data that surgical exploration is the best. I published a paper a few years ago where I looked at 68 patients who were referred to me with uh, occult primary tumors. Those 68 patients had had 177 upper endoscopies, colonoscopies, CAT scans, MRIs, capsule videography, dotatate PET scans, of which 6% claimed to have found a primary. But I operated on all these pe people. It turns out two thirds of those claims were actually incorrect. When I got in there, the thing that the radiologist said was the primary actually wasn't. That was a lymph node or perhaps a uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis uh, implant. So my my success rate with surgical exploration is now up to 90% in finding occult primary tumors. Um, I have an operating room nurse who's worked with me for 19 years. She times me. My average time to find a primary in the times when I do find it is three minutes. Um, so the strategy is very simple. You go, you go where the money is. Um, most of these occult primary tumors are statistically going to be in the small bowel. And while residents are trained to start at the ligament of trites and run the bowel proximal to distal, it's backwards with neuroendocrine tumors. They're in the distal bowel. So I start at the ileocecal valve and go proximal. And you have to inspect the bowel three times, three ways, by inspection, palpation, and even transillumination. And these tumors can be, as mentioned by Dr. Suarez, is very tiny and four or five millimeters in size. Uh, if if we don't find it there or in the appendix, then we will do an uh, esophageal gastroduodenoscopy on the operating table as our next step. The advantage we have there is that we can transilluminate the stomach and the duodenum that a gastroenterologist in a clinic could not. And so we'll look for these tiny little shadows by dimming the operating room lights. 
if we don't find it there, and that's actually a lower statistical probability, then we go for the pancreas. And we'll do an intraoperative ultrasonogram on the pancreas, which can be actually about 15% more sensitive than an endoscopic ultrasound. We also have the advantage that the gastroenterologists do not, that we can perform a coker maneuver where we mobilize the duodenum and the head of the pancreas, and we can do ultrasonography from both the front and the back. And then we'll mobilize the tail of the pancreas so that we can do that from multiple sides. And uh, that also increases the pickup rate by about 15%. And then my last step is if we don't find it by any of those means, and uh, we'll actually do a duodenotomy and we will palpate the uh, walls of the duodenum with our fingers, both in the duodenum and outside. That's a long uh, held technique for finding gastronomas. So it, it, it can find other types of duodenal tumors as well. Great, thank you. We're gonna have a follow-up question for you in a bit, Dr. Pamir, but next question is for Dr. El Haddad. Can you explain more about somatostatin receptor-based imaging for neuroendocrine tumors? Are there other scans like PET scans that can be helpful? Yes, hi, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so somatostatin uh, receptor imaging is, is an essential part for uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors, they, they overexpress the somatostatin receptors, mainly somatostatin receptor 2. And, um, you know, in the past, we've had uh, the main imaging for somatostatin receptors to be uh, or still being used is uh, indium 111 pentatriotide or octreoscan. So the, the the goal here is to target the the receptor the somatostatin receptors on the neuroendocrine tumors. So the more receptors that are, the more uh, radioactivity you can see uh, in those tumors. And that was uh, part of the, uh, for example, for Netter one trial, uh, the uh, include one of the inclusion criteria was that the patient's uh, tumors uh, had to have at least a what we call a Krenning score of two or above. Krenning score used to be a, uh, or you know, still used in, in when we use a SPECT scan uh, in uh, determining how much radioactivity is in the uh, uh, tumors, and we compare that those tumors to the uptake in the liver. Um, so we inject the patient with indium-111 uh, pentatriotide, and then you look at the concentration of the uh, radioactivity in the tumors. And if it's more than the liver, it's usually two or above. And if it's less, it's uh, it's a lower score. And so these scores are semi-quantitative, just to give us an idea of how much recept how much recept the somatostatin receptors are on the neuroendocrine tumors. And more recently, we started doing also PET scans. So it's a different imaging technique. It's also in nuclear medicine, but instead of doing a SPECT CT scan, we do a PET CT scan. Now, PET CT scan, you mentioned that it's it's just the the uh, the imaging technique, but within uh, PET CT, you can have different types of uh, of imaging based on what radioactive material we inject the patients. So similar to how we image the patient with SPECT CT by giving indium-111 pentatriotide, we can do a PET scan also targeting the somatostatin receptors, but now with uh, different agents labeled with copper-64 or gallium-68, uh, dotatate. Again, similarly targeting the somatostatin receptors, but now we have positron emission instead of gamma emission. So the imaging is a little bit different. We, you know, we think that we have more accurate uh, uh, evaluation of the somatostatin receptors with PET scan compared to the SPECT. Uh, SPECT is probably more available, but nowadays most people do PET scans for the evaluation of somatostatin receptors. Now there is, um, you know, other than looking for the somatostatin receptors, we can also uh, sometimes combine that with FDG PET scan. Uh, so looking at the uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, it's a radioactive sugar, because some of the uh, uh, tumors, some of the receptors may be missing, uh, may, may have less somatostatin, some of the tumors may have less somatostatin receptors, but have more use of uh, sh uh, radioactive sugar. And the more aggressive the tumors that are, the higher the uptake on the FDG PET CT scan and the lower the uptake on the uh, dotatate PET scan or the Octrio scan. 
And in patients who have a grade two, grade three, sometimes we may do both scans to see if they do have these heterogeneity in the tumors, because in the same patient, you can have tumors that have more uptake on the FTG PET scan versus more uptake on the dotatate PET scan. And that can help us also, uh, you know, aim, target the, uh, or plan for therapies, which we'll probably mention in the, uh, you know, uh, later on with, with PRRT. So that's, it's an important concept. Um, and that sometimes we can do different types of, of imaging in nuclear medicine with PET scan with different radio tracers just to identify uh, the, the behavior of the uh, tumors in the patient's body. Great. Thank you, Dr. El Haddad. Um, there is a question from the audience, um, and anyone can weigh in. Uh, so what is your approach for treating bone metastases, particularly those to the spine? Is cryoablation used to treat bone mass? Well, um, I mean, I leave for this uh, first uh, others, but um, as an interventional radiologist, usually with these, with the bone metastases, most commonly there are more than just one lesion. But um, if you have limited disease in one area, um, we sometimes can do localized uh, uh, therapies to to control the disease in that uh, in that bone. If there is, uh, you know, risk of fracture, we can do um, vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, combine that with the cert you know certain type of ablation with radiofrequency, microwave, or cryoablation. Um, but that's a, that's as a very localized uh, therapy. Usually, patients who have you know metastatic disease. Um, you can have, you know, pretty well control with different types of systemic therapies that my, my colleagues, all, you know, can speak better about it. But sometimes, yes, we, we can do localized therapies uh, for bone meds. Yeah, I should just jump in as um, I'm, I'm someone that does um, some many of the systemic treatments is in, in as one of my uh, dear colleagues here, Courtney Scape, who is a surgeon, we just had a regional meeting and she, for many questions, she said, it depends. And it truly depends. It can be from nothing because they are not clinically relevant and they are not causing any troubles to something that is really causing a lot of trouble because they are causing pain or they have a large burden and we think they're going to cause fractures. So to strengthen the bone and to protect um, some of this, if we, if we feel we need to um, treat um, for uh, um, bone strengthening reasons, we can use medications that will make the bone um, strength, such as um, uh, acid uh, zolomidric or zomedra and um, um, Exgiva, which is another um, medication, the commercial name for that. Um, if, the, if they are causing pain, we can also do radiation um, to this, to specific focal lesions that are causing radiation. And depending on the case, obviously surgery can be um, entertained for a particular specific reason. And obviously all the systemic treatments that we can use for neuroendocrine tumors, particular um, with the use of PRT, which I'm sure we'll talk later, uh, can help with bone disease. So it really depends on how much disease you have, how many symptoms of that you have, and, and the goal of your treatment is for disease control from the tumor um, spreading or is for symptom control because that is causing some sort of symptomatic issue. Great. Thanks, uh, Dr. El Haddad and Dr. Suarez. Um, the next question uh, would be for Dr. Maxwell. Uh, can you discuss surgical treatment for gastrointestinal and neuroendocrine tumors? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, NET is a fairly unique disease from a cancer perspective, um, not only because of the cells from which it arises, but also because surgery can actually be offered at every stage and be, can be considered, you know, as a part of the patient's management plan. If we think about small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, um, in particular, because these are going to be the most common type um, outside of rectal, which usually ties for pancreas is the second most common. But rectal are often, as Dr. Suarez had mentioned, managed endoscopically, which is um, great because it minimizes the chance that you'll need to have a major operation on your rectum. 
Um, so thinking about small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, um, you know, when the disease is confined to the bowel, and as Dr. Pamier said, you know, the tumors are often very small, located in the end of the bowel called the ileum. Um, and in 30 to 45% of patients, there are multiple of these tumors in the bowel. So it was really important when Dr. Pamier mentioned palpating or feeling the bowel, that that happens as a part of your operation. Um, but when the, the disease is there, or perhaps spread to the lymph nodes, either because you can see that it has, like the mesenteric mass that Dr. Pamier was speaking about, or, you know, when the pathologist takes a look at the specimen and finds that there are cancer cells in the lymph nodes in the mesentery, hopefully um, your surgeon can do an operation that removes all of the tumors in the bowel and that swath of mesentery, which for those maybe less familiar with the surgical anatomy, um, you know, the blood vessel, there's a major vein and a major artery that bring blood to and from your small intestine, um, the SMV and the SMA. And the lymph nodes run along these blood vessels. So the operation involves removing that length of bowel and then the blood vessels that run in between um, that bowel and what we call the root of the mesentery. And you remove all of that because that's where the lymph nodes are. So when you can do that, and then hopefully put the two ends of the bowel back together, you can operate for cure. Um, you know, but like I said, you can operate on these tumors even if they've spread to other places. So that's when the disease has metastasized. This is stage four disease. Um, and while the decision to operate needs to be made very carefully, and it's often discussed in a multidisciplinary setting, so you know, with interventional radiology, with medical oncology, um, there's really a lot of good reasons for surgery to be considered. Um, there are retrospective data suggesting that if we can remove the vast majority of the disease, we may help patients live longer. Um, you know, it's important to, to note, again, the retrospective nature of those studies. But um, Additionally, I think it provides a good chance to hit reset on the disease. And what I mean by that is if we can remove the disease or the vast majority of the disease and therefore allow, for instance, Dr. Suarez to say, great, you have done a lot of the heavy lifting and I will therefore hold these medical therapies until a later date. That's great because now we've been able to kind of stretch the therapies along the patient's cancer journey for a much longer time than we may otherwise have been able to do. Um, when you're operating in the context of metastases or stage four disease, you're really not operating for cure anymore, right? Because these little cancer cells have already had the opportunity to, to be spit in a number of different places and the cat is sort of out of the bag, but there's a lot of good reasons to consider it. And particularly, um, you know, beyond that for what these tumors are famous for, right? Carcinoid syndrome, um, you know, producing hormones and therefore symptoms, that's another good reason to consider surgical debulking, um, both to remove the primary tumor and as many metastases as you can, because removing, even if you don't get all of the tumor, but most of the metastatic disease can decrease a patient's symptoms and can be very helpful. Um, there are sort of special considerations if a patient has a lot of metastases that maybe we're not able to remove with an operation, but the, the tumor is still in the bowel. Um, removing that tumor in the bowel is has been shown to be beneficial as it prevents future complications. So that's one more indication um, for operating on these tumors. Okay. Um, before we move on to the next one, we have a question from our live audience, and this could be for any members of the panel. Uh, can you discuss lung carcinoids in particular that have spread to the liver and bone? I can um, take that one. All right. Um, so I have a very large database I've built up over 32 years. Uh, only 20% of lung carcinoid patients will develop liver metastases over the course of the disease. It, it seems to be a much more favorable uh, subtype. Um, they typically will have superdiaphragmatic nodal disease and bone metastases when the liver metastases show up. I have never seen a lung carcinoid patient die of anything other than liver failure. 
um, if the primary is out. They can die of pneumonia and, and pulmonary complications if the primary is left in. So um, I am publishing a paper right now on liver debulking for specifically for lung carcinoids. It took me a lot of years to acquire enough cases to say anything about it statistically. So while the survival for the debulking of lung metastases uh, in, in neuronic and tumors to the liver is not as good as we get with small bowel and pancreas debulking, it, the survival rate is still vastly superior to what we get for complete resection of colorectal liver metastases. The five-year survival rate is coming out around 65%, and the 10-year survival rate is about 35%. Uh, whereas if you look at complete resection of all comers with colorectal metastases, you get a five-year survival rate of about 37%. So I think it's worth uh, debulking those if you can. If not, then you move on to liver embolizations and other um, liver-directed therapies because that's what's going to get them is the liver. Dr. Pomier, uh, did you look on the behavior? Um, I know that typically by the WHO classification, we don't look at KI-67. On, on on these tumors, but do you have any subgroup analysis on on that? Yes, I did. So um, interestingly, so in my liver debulking papers for small bowel, uh, only about a th uh, we didn't have anybody that no, we had one patient in the series who had a grade three surprise metastasis, and in the pancreas group, it was four percent. Um, so most of these patients will still say, you know, be well well differentiated and low and intermediate grade. Among the lungs, we actually found that 19% of patients had a grade three metastasis, uh, but we only found that out after liver debulking. And so like when you look at the liver, people are classified typically based on a single liver metastasis. And, and what we found was there's cons considerably more heterogeneity. Uh, the time to liver progression was much shorter in the patients who had any proven grade three metastases, but it did not affect survival. So um, it's like, you know, typically for a lung carcinoid patient, I will watch them for a period of time before I debulk them to get a sense for the cadence of the disease. One of the least gratifying things I can do in life is go in and debulk a liver and it just gets rapidly repopulated and uh, we have to move on to other therapies and they really didn't need to spend time recovering from that operation. Dr. Pemba, I'm going to keep you on the hot spot and ask you, can you discuss surgical treatment for a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, particularly um, the surgical options, indications, risks, and what patients should expect for recovery? Okay, certainly. So uh, first of all, we recommend surgical resection for all of the functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So if you have a gastrinoma, an insulinoma, a glucagonoma, a vipoma, those should be resected rather than watched. And that is because with those tumors, you actually have to fight two wars for survival. Besides an oncologic war, as we're talking about with all these other tumors, there is a hormonal war. And gastrinomas can kill patients by bleeding and perforation. And insulinomas can kill patients with hypoglycemia. Glucagonomas can kill them with malnutrition and inanition. And vipomas can kill with diarrhea and hypokalemia. So all of those should be resected if at all feasible. Uh, when we get to the other tumors, um, then we have lots of options, typically based on size and location. So small neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas that we elect to resect can often be enucleated. Neuroendocrine tumors are different than adenocarcinomas, which are infiltrative and, and need uh, wide radical resections. Neuroendocrine tumors really are expansile and they, they don't have these tentacles extending into the rest of the pancreas. So as long as it's not close to a major duct, uh, you can consider enucleation. And you're typically, we, you know, we have a good idea about that from CAT scans, MRIs, MRCPs, and particularly endoscopic ultrasonography. But the final test is when you're actually in there and you can do an, an, an intraoperative ultrasonogram on the pancreas. Uh, beyond that, if you're going to have to do major resections, and we look at it in two major categories, those that can be dealt with with a distal pancreatectomy and those that are in the head and uh, unsinate process that might require a Whipple resection. So uh, 
Distal pancreatectomies, if the tumor is large, these tumors very rapidly get into the splenic vein, which has a consistency of, of you know, tissue paper uh, compared to a Bunsen burner hose for the artery. Uh, so most of those patients will require a, a uh, splenectomy with it. If there isn't such invasion, we can actually consider a spleen sparing distal pancreatectomy. Um, with uh, Whipple's, it's a whole different game. It's much different than the Whipple done for adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. Those patients typically only present with painless jaundice. And that gives a lot of surgical advantages because they will have uh, a dilated, thickened wall bile duct that will hold sutures very, very nicely and not leak. They will have pancreatic obstruction that will give you a nice, firm, cork-like pancreas gland with a very large pancreatic duct, like a cocktail straw that you can do a duct to mucosa anastomosis. You don't get that with neuroendocrine tumors. They don't, they rarely cause obstructive jaundice. So you will have a very thin walled, uh, non-dilated bile duct that you have to do a very careful anastomosis on. And the pancreas gland will be butter soft and not hold stitches well. And sometimes you can't even find the pancreatic duct to do a duct to duct uh, anastomosis. So I tell patients they're going to leak. I mean, there are three rules in surgery that we teach medical students. Eat now because you don't know when your next meal will be. Sleep when you can because you might be up all night and never touch the pancreas. I break all three rules every week. Um, but um, so you have to tell patients if they're going to have a Whipple resection, they're probably going to leak compared to other experiences that patients have with adenocarcinoma in the pancreas. Um, so uh, we drain pa patients um, we can use passereotide or as, a, as an agent that's been shown to reduce pancreatic fistula rates and things like that. I think one careful consideration when you have patients who do have liver metastases in removing the primary is whether you should do a Whipple or not. Because again, what my database shows is that pancreatic neuronectin patients overwhelmingly die of liver failure. And liver-directed therapies, such as embolizations uh, and even liver resections, uh, they have a, if once you make a, an anastomosis between the pancreatic, uh, or excuse me, the small bowel and the biliary tree, that entire liver becomes colonized and they will, they're very likely to get abscesses. And so I might actually recommend some patients where I think they're going to need major liver-directed therapy that we don't remove the pancreas. Uh, as Jessica was mentioning with other with the small bowel tumors, there are many studies that have shown, even in the case of inoperable metastatic disease, removing a pancreas primary does result in, in better survival in many, many studies. There are too many of them to consider that it might all just be selection bias. And other things that have shown, like uh, if Dr. Haldanad wants to talk about PRRT later on, it's like the Rotterdam group showed that uh, patients who were subsequently treated with PRRT had better outcomes if their primary tumors had been removed. And the pancreas group showed that with much more strong statistics than any other subgroup. Before we get to the next, next question, I just wanted to mention, obviously, Dr. Pami and Dr. Maxwell are are um, very experienced surgeons who could help with patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Also for our audience and our uh, patients, uh, if you ever need to find an experienced surgeon in the near future, uh, I just wanted to mention that the AES Surgeon Finder is available on our website where you could uh, look for certain surgeons who deal with uh, pa adrenal, pancreas, or GI neuroendocrine tumors, and you could search by state. And so there is some access to that. And we will continue. Okay. All right. So our next question is for Dr. Yu. Um, so the, the panelist questions are, what is carcinoid syndrome? What causes it? And what are the symptoms? And how can it be treated? I know that you've already answered several of those questions. Maybe you could just give us a quick uh, recap and maybe focus more on the uh, how is it treated medical uh, therapy. So, so uh for uh, uh, functioning uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, you know, I described carcinoid earlier. So we'll just uh, talk about uh, uh, diagnosis and management of uh, functioning neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the diagnosis uh, and, uh, of neuron functioning neuroendocrine tumors is uh, slightly different uh, than uh, diagnosing of those non-functioning tumors. For example, uh, 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 about two-thirds or more 
pancreatic organ tumors are non-functional. There are usually incidental findings or so CMS in the pancreas. So whether you have a tumor or not, it's, 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 it's uh, very uh, certain. Well, for people with symptoms of uh, functioning organ tumors, such as someone may have a low blood sugar, someone may have a stomach ache, um, uh, whether they have a neuroendocrine tumor actually is uh, uh, quite a challenging to establish. And uh, they, uh, some people may have a uh, suggestive symptom, but uh, um, imaging uh, or by any other endoscopy exam, uh, they, they may not uh, um, you know, uh, have any evident tumor. And in these cases, actually neuroendocrine tumor is ruled out. Uh, so um, we should not continue the futile attempt uh, to uh, uh, search for a non-existing tumor. And I often tell my patient, uh, uh, if the imaging, extensive imaging did not find a tumor, uh, then you do not have a tumor. Uh, for management, as Dr. Peng Ye uh, uh, pointed out already, uh, uh, people with a functional neuron tumor uh, has uh, you know, two issues to deal with. Uh, they have a tumor in the first place and also have a, uh, the hormone secret by the tumor. Uh, for the tumor part, uh, really the treatment uh, principle is similar to any other neuron tumors. So if, for example, you do uh, surgical debulking uh, followed by treatment of liver metastasis and then followed by systemic therapy. Uh, for uh, 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 certain uh, uh, functional neuron tumors such as uh, uh, insuloma, usually only uh, a, a local resection of the pancreas will be uh, curative. For gastrinoma, um, if you can identify it uh, reliably, uh, uh, the, the surgery often is uh, 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 curative or the patient can be in a long-term remission uh, uh, after the surgical uh, uh, treatment. Um, if the, uh, if the, the patient does have a liver metastasis, uh, then uh, you know, uh, our interventional radiologist will handle that or they can do uh, systemic therapy. Uh, for the specific tumor syndrome, there are also uh, specific treatment. Uh, for example, in people with uh, non-curative uh, gastrinoma, uh, we use a protopump inhibitors uh, to decrease their gastric acid production. Um, uh, you know, for uh, uh, people with uh, carcinoid syndrome, uh, we can give them calotristat to decrease uh, serotonin uh, production. And uh, for, uh, you know, recently in the Neuron Journal, actually there is a novel uh, insulin antibody uh, to help with uh, the hypoglycemia in patients with uh, metastatic uh, uh, insuloma. And uh, of, of course, the somatostatin analog uh, is quite useful in all patients with a functioning neuron tumor, uh, especially after a surgical attempt. Great, thank you, Dr. Yu. Um, Dr. Suarez, I know we've discussed um, already some metasta about metastatic neuron tumors. But how do you decide which treatment to use in individual cases? And can you discuss any clinical trials that are available right now? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Yeah, that's a that's a long, um, that's a complex again um, answer. But in general, um, we have few um, um, systemic treatments. We have the somatosin analogs that are the hormonal shots that typically for most of the cases tend to be the first type of treatment that we're going to use especially if uh, for patients that have functional tumors, but if they do not have functional tumors, um, um, we also can use that. It has been shown that prolonged the time that these tumors will take um, to grow. Then uh, we have some pills, which are, are tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we can use. Then we have chemotherapies, including chemotherapy pills that we can use. And uh, the PRRT, which I, I joke and say radiation through the vein, that essentially you buy a peptide, you buy a radioisotope to, to a peptide that is similar to a somatostatin analog, and then inject it to the tumors, which is very personalized to, to the tumors because it's looking for the receptors on the cells. And, and Dr. Haddad, I'm sure, is going to talk more a little bit. Um, so for tumors that are very um, slow-growing and indolent, or when they are um, the first um, step, we think more about starting with somatostatin analogs. When the somatostatin analogs are no longer helping to stop tumor growth, then um, in the small bowel, I tend to favor uh, the PRRT versus the other pills that we mentioned. In the pancreas, 
um, is a big discussion that is often a tumor board discussion whether you should be doing uh, PRRT versus potentially the chemo pills and talking about trials. Actually, there is a trial that is sponsored by the National Cancer Institute that I'm, I'm blessed to be part of the, the leadership role. And Dr. Hobney from um, the Alliance Group at, uh, in Mayo is the main chair for that study, is looking at exactly this. For patients that need um, systemic treatment, should we do PRRT or should we do chemotherapy with uh, capecitabine and, and uh, uh, timosolamide, which is called CAPE-10. Um, and then after that, that's when I, I'm using the TKIs. And there's a new TKI that hopefully will become available, uh, which is called cabozatinib. There was a study done, again, sponsored by the National Cancer Institute that was actually closed earlier because they saw uh, encouraging results both in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as well as the non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And we are waiting for the final analysis publications. The preliminary data has been presented on a European uh, meeting recently, and I'm, I'm sure they're going to submit that data to the FDA, and hopefully we'll have another uh, possibility. So first line, somatosk analogs. And then uh, second line to me, the big decision is PRT versus CAPE-10, particularly if the tumors have positivity on a somatostin receptor imaging, the dotatate. And then I leave the TKIs, the other oral, medications for later in my and for for um, um, small bowel cape 10 which the chemotherapy pills has less um, validity but sometimes in some occasions especially if the tumors are more aggressive we can use um, also if the disease is not truly systemic treatment but if the disease is mainly focused in the in the liver we can use liver embolizations and um, uh, because they can treat the liver and never forget about your um, good old friend surgeon because they can go in and help with cleaning up as has been um, mentioned before at any time so you, you know that you feel that is appropriate so it's not only oh I need to have a surgical assessment in the beginning of the disease there might be opportunity if in the beginning they don't make sense depending on the situation uh, it, it might be um, a case that surgery can be done um, um, in the future and can help. I, I really see uh, surgery as a, as a huge uh, part and always will favor that if it makes sense because then we can keep the other treatments um, for later. And um, there's other trials that we can talk about. We also have a, have a trial looking into patients that had the resected pancreas tumor if they, if they have uh, high-risk pictures for recurrence. When we think they don't have any disease that we can see, we can also use um, chemotherapy post the resection. To and the question to be answered that does doing chemotherapy post the resection decreases the odds of the tumor coming back in the initial three years because we know that 30% um, or so of these tumors, if they were to come back, will come back um, in the first three years. They can come back for many more years after that, you know, ten up to 10 years or more. But for the purpose of the study, we're looking at the initial um, uh, time. And I think Dr. El Haddad, who is one of the lead co-authors of a New England paper that led to the approval of Lutatero PRT in the U.S., I'm sure he can teach us a lot about PRT. Thank you, Dr. Soares. Um, it seems like we got about five minutes left. Uh, Dr. El Haddad, uh, can you explain how Lutathera works and what cases it might be useful for? Yes, very quickly with what uh, time is left. Um, so, in summary, I mentioned initially the you know the diagnosis and how we image neuroendocrine tumors, and um, I just have to touch on the uh, word of teranostics, meaning in nuclear medicine right now we we treat what we see. So the same way how we target the somatostatin receptors with uh, a synthetic peptides, octreotide, uh, with a couple with, with imaging, uh, uh, with radionuclides for imaging, for example, we have gamma and we have uh, positron emitters. Same way we can target those receptors. Uh, we can do that with therapy. So if we see that the patient has the uh, uh, somatostatin receptors on that imaging, we can treat them with PRRT, which is peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. It's a systemic radiotherapy done uh, as an intravenous injection, as Dr. Uh, Suarez uh, mentioned. These are patients usually who have uh, progressed 
uh, uh, on uh, different types of uh, previous therapies. Now, the, the approval in the U.S. was done based on the NETR1 trial, which was done on the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, but also on data from Rotterdam, from the Erasmus study that was done on not just mid-gut, but different types of neuroendocrine tumors, including lung and pancreas. And, you know, if you take overall these, uh, the results of the different trials and retrospective and prospective studies, you get about 30 to 40 uh, months of uh, progression-free survival when we use uh, PRRT. And, and sometimes, uh, as Dr. Pomir mentioned, in pancreatic cancer, we can have, uh, you know, it's sometimes longer than, uh, than small bowel or the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. So um, in patients who um, have the imaging that, uh, you know, before we decide whether we're going to do PRRT or not, we have to scan them to make sure that the tumors, and that's where it becomes a little bit difficult because we have to make sure that all the tumors, or at least most of the tumors, exhibit these somatostatin receptors. Otherwise, uh, we would they would not be candidates for PRRT because, you know, if you give the radiation, it's not going to concentrate in those spots. Um, so once we establish that they are good candidates, um, you know, they get uh, the therapy, it's every two months um, with intravenous injection. It's usually given with an infusion of amino acids to decrease the concentration of radioactivity in the kidneys and, and protect, uh, protect the kidneys. So it takes the, the therapy takes about a few hours, three to four hours, and it's done every every two months. Uh, for a total of uh, four injections. Sometimes we can add, do two more uh, therapies if the patient had uh, good control of their tumors for at least a year or a year and a half. We can uh, give two more uh, uh, treatments, uh, and that's with the with the currently approved uh, uh, beta emitter uh, lutetium one seventy seven dotatate uh, PRRT. But there are multiple studies currently being done on different types of uh, PRRTs, namely with alpha therapy. So instead of the beta emission, uh, we have now uh, multiple trials on alpha. PRRT, where instead of the beta, you have an alpha uh, emission that, uh, but we don't still have, you know, full data on on, uh, on that. Um, as far as the, um, the, the risks of the, of the therapy or the potential side effects, um, it's a, you know, pretty uh, well-tolerated therapy, but uh, we have to make sure that patient's kidney functions and liver function are, are well before we uh, put them on the treatment. And uh, we have noticed after we started treating patients that we also have to pay attention at where the tumors are located in the abdomen, because some people, some patients may be at a higher risk with PRRT with bowel obstruction, depending if there are peritoneal implants, if there is bowel, sorry, if there is bowel tethering from the mesenteric masses. And that's when we sometimes have to send patients to Dr. Pamir and or, or surgeons to do some debulking surgery to decrease the chances of bowel obstruction post-PRRT. Or if there is encasement of the of the uh, visceral, uh, of the uh, superior mesenteric artery or the celiac artery. So those are things that uh, we have discovered while we starting treating uh, patients. So there are things that we have to look for before we uh, put the patients on, on the treatment to make sure that they're good uh, candidates. Um, other side effects, common side effect could be fatigue and that can sometimes affect us uh, or, or lead us into changing doses or skipping treatment to see if the patient can still tolerate. Um, as long as the patient has normal renal function and kidney function, the risk of uh, uh, dysfunction is, is very low, less than 1%. Uh, one important thing that we watch is the uh, counts, is the blood counts. White counts can decrease platelets, usually more commonly, uh, or hemoglobin, especially if the patient has extensive uh, disease in the bone marrow. Um, and there is a long-term risk of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, about you know two percent, and uh, also risk of that progressing into acute myeloid leukemia. And those we found that they have a higher risk in patients who have received uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, uh, before before the PRRT. So that's um, you know I think you know the quick summary of the of the therapy. But there are a lot of other nuances. But uh, I hope I was able to cover it well. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dr. Eladad. Um, looks like we're unfortunately out of time. Uh, we'd like to thank our viewers and supporters for joining us this evening. Uh, special thanks to our expert panelists for taking the time out of their busy schedules to answer your questions and discussing around the consumers. We also want to thank Nanitz for their support. As a reminder, this session was recorded and will be, will be available on the AAES Facebook page and YouTube channel. For more health farm information for patients, please be sure to visit the AAES Patient Education website at www.collectedmed.com forward slash, this will also be written, but it's AAES Patient Education. And uh, if you have any other questions, um, please um, let us know. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening.